This lecture is on chapter 26, which is the urinary system. And so we're first going to look at the functions of the urinary system. There are three functions. The first function is excretion. Excretion is the removal of organic wastes from the body. So the body creates wastes and then the kidneys help to get rid of those wastes. They do that through two processes that are called filtration and secretion. The second function of the urinary system is elimination. So after the kidneys excrete these waste products, then through elimination, the urinary system discharges them from the body. And this process is called urination. The third function of the urinary system is homeostatic regulation. This is probably the biggest function of all. With homeostatic regulation, it controls the volume and the solute concentration of the blood. So I wanna explain homeostatic regulation a little bit further. We're gonna look at that on the next slide. So throughout this chapter, we'll be looking at the homeostatic regulation. I'm going to list these right now, and then we'll go into those further in depth. So first of all, the homeostatic regulation means that the kidneys adjust the volume of water lost in the urine. The kidney can do this by releasing two hormones called erythropoietin and renin. So we will talk about those a little later in the chapter. Next, the kidney can adjust plasma ion concentrations. So it controls, this means that it's going to control the quantities of ions such as um, sodium, potassium, and chloride ions. And it can do this by controlling how much of these things are lost in the urine. So if we lose more sodium, there will be less in the plasma. If we lose less potassium in the urine, there will be more potassium in the urine. Next, the kidneys stabilize the blood pH. So blood pH in a large part is controlled by the number of hydrogen ions there are. So if there are more hydrogen ions, then the blood pH becomes more acidic. And we know the blood pH should be between 7.35 to 7.45. That's the normal pH of blood. So if there's more hydrogen ions and the blood becomes more acidic, then the kidneys can excrete hydrogen ions by getting rid of the hydrogen then the blood becomes less acidic and falls back into the normal range next the kidneys conserve valuable nutrients what that means is that they prevent excretion uh, in elimination of valuable nutrients such as glucose and amino acids. They make sure that glucose and amino acids don't end up in the urine and instead they get reabsorbed back into the body. And the last homeostatic regulatory mechanism that the kidneys have is that they assist the liver in detoxifying poisons. Let's take a look at the blood supply to the kidneys. The kidneys are going to receive blood again from that renal artery. So here's the renal artery that I abbreviated as RA.
So the kidneys receive 20 to 25% of the total cardiac output. So every time the heart beats, 25% of the blood that's pushed out of the left ventricle is going to go to the kidneys. That means that about 1,200 milliliters of blood is going to flow through the kidneys every minute. Right, so the kidneys are receiving blood from the renal artery. So here's the renal artery. And the renal artery enters into the kidneys at the hilum. And then the renal arteries are going to branch right away into what we call segmental arteries. The segmental arteries then will divide into interlobar arteries. So the interlobar arteries are basically traveling through the renal columns up alongside those renal pyramids. The interlobar arteries then arc around the more superficial part of the renal pyramids. And then radiating off of those arcuate arteries are these cortical radiate arteries. So the arcuate arteries arc around and the cortical radiate arteries, they radiate off of the arcuate artery. So now they're radiating out into the renal cortex. So then coming off of the cortical radiate arteries, we have these smaller arterioles because arteries become arterioles. And these arterioles are called afferent arterioles. The afferent arterioles have a little bulge in them uh, where there's a group of capillaries that are called the glomerulus. So this is unique because usually when an arterial uh, branches off into capillaries, it then becomes a venule. But in this case, the afferent arterial branches off into these glomerular capillaries and then converge again to form the efferent arterial. So it's sort of a specialized capillary bed. They're still arterioles. It's just that we have this special little uh, capillary bed that's called the glomerulus. The glomerulus is in the renal corpuscle, which we're gonna talk about in a little bit. So it's in a part of the nephron, which is a functional unit of the kidneys. So we will talk about that in just a couple of minutes. Right now, we're just talking about blood supply. So now those efferent arterioles will become capillaries and the capillaries we call peritubular capillaries. They're gonna surround the tubes of the uh, nephron. So that's why we call it peri for around, and it's a tubular, it's a tubule, so it's peritubular. Again, I'm gonna show you this in a different picture. But the efferent arterioles become capillaries. So finally we have eight arterioles becoming capillaries. And then the arterioles will then become venules. So in these capillaries, we have our normal exchange of oxygen. So oxygen leaves and they pick up carbon dioxide. And now those capillaries are going to become venules. And then those venules have to make their way back out of the kidney. So from there, the venules will become the cortical radiate veins. And then the cortical radiate veins will become the arcuate veins. And then the arcuate veins will become the interlobar veins. And the interlobar veins will drain directly into the renal vein. So the only difference here going out as opposed to going in is that there is no segmental vein. Right, so that's important to know, but it's also important to know the, the sequence of these arteries coming in and then what happens in the nephron and then the sequence of those veins going back out. So here's a close-up picture. We can see the renal pyramid. Here's the interlobar artery and then it arcs around. So that's the arcuate artery and then we have the cortical radiate arteries that are radiating off of that. And then coming off of those cortical radiate arteries, we see the afferent arterioles. And then they're going right into the glomerulus. So the glomerulus is that little um, capillary 
uh, that will go into the nephron of the kidney. So you get the point. We've got all of these little afferent arterioles coming off of the cortical radiate arteries. So let's start looking at the structure and the anatomy of kidneys. Kidneys are paired organs, meaning there's two of them. They're located on either side of the vertebral column. They have um, adrenal glands sitting right over the top of them. So here we can see the two kidneys and here's the adrenal glands. There's one adrenal gland sitting on top of the left kidney and there's an adrenal gland sitting on top of the right kidney. The blood supply going into the kidneys comes from the abdominal aorta. And so the abdominal aorta has these two branches bringing blood into the kidneys and those arteries are called the renal arteries. So the left renal artery goes into the left kidney and then the right renal artery goes into the right kidney. When blood exits the kidneys, it's going to exit through the renal veins. So the right renal vein comes out of the right kidney and the left renal vein comes out of the left kidney. The hilum is the point of entry for the renal artery and the renal nerves and the point of exit for the renal vein and the ureter. The ureter is a long tube that delivers the urine down to the urinary bladder. On the outside of the kidney, we have the renal capsule. So this whole thing in here that I'm drawing uh, out here, this whole thing is the renal capsule. And so that goes all the way around the outside of the kidney. This uh, fibrous capsule helps to protect the kidney. Just inside the capsule is the superficial portion of the kidney that's in contact with that renal capsule and it's called the renal cortex. So the renal cortex is this whole outer portion here. So I'm just gonna color that in blue so you can see where that is. All of this is that renal cortex. It's superficial. It still has that renal capsule that surrounds it. So the renal capsule goes all the way around it. Okay. Then the innermost portion is called the renal medulla. And the renal medulla has a couple of different structures in it. There are these renal pyramids. So those are in the renal medulla. Okay, so I'm just gonna color these in here. Those are renal pyramids. And then in between the renal pyramids, we have these renal columns. So here's the renal columns. In there. Okay. Now, um, so this whole thing, uh, the renal medulla includes both the pyramids and the columns, right? All the way through the medulla. So the layer is the medulla, and the pyramids and the columns are the structures in the medulla. Those renal columns, they're really just an extension of the um, cortical. Uh, renal cortex of that tissue that goes down in between those renal pyramids. The tip of each one of those renal pyramids is called a renal papilla. So each of the tips in there, those are called the renal papilla. Okay, the renal papilla discharge into these small tubules that are called the minor calyx. So here we see a minor calyx right here. Kind of draw those in a little bit. There's a minor calyx, there's a minor calyx, there's one. So in all these places, this is where the uh, renal papilla is draining into. Then four or five of the minor calyces drain into a larger area, just a larger tubule, and that larger tubule is called the major calyx. So here we see the major calyx. There's a major calyx there too, right? Then two or three of these major calyces 
are going to drain into this area here, which is more expanded, and that is called the renal pelvis. And then the renal pelvis is connected to this ureter. So this ureter is a passageway that will take the urine out of the kidney and it will um, take it down to the urinary bladder. So this is the nephron. This is the functional unit of the kidney. So first of all, I wanna kinda of help you to get your bearings. Uh, if you remember that afferent arterial, it's right here. So there's the afferent arterial, and it branches off into this capillary bed that's called the glomerulus, and then the capillaries merge together to form the efferent arterial. So that's uh, exactly where that nephron starts. Now the nephron is one big tubule and it has different parts to it. The first part of this long tube, is, uh, which is the nephron, is called the glomerular capsule. And the glomerular capsule and that glomerulus together form what we call the renal corpuscle. Right, so together, both the glomerulus, which is right here, and that glomerular capsule, they form that renal corpuscle. The next section of the tubule is called the proximal convoluted tubule. So it's called proximal because it's closest to the renal corpuscle, and it's called convoluted because it has all of these bends and turns in it. From there, the proximal convoluted tubule leads into the nephron loop. So this is the part of the tubule that, that goes down into the medulla, and then it loops back around and it comes back up into the cortex. So this nephron loop has a descending limb, which is where the fluid is gonna flow down deeper into the medulla, and then it has an ascending limb where the fluid in the tubule will ascend and move back into the cortex area again. The next segment of the tubule then is the distal convoluted tubule. So the fluid from the nephron loop moves into this distal convoluted tubule. Again, it's distal because it's furthest away from the renal corpuscle, convoluted because it also has some bends and turns in it. From there, the distal convoluted tubule will empty into the collecting duct. Several nephrons will have their distal convoluted tubules draining into the collecting duct. At the end of the collecting duct then is a papillary duct. The papillary duct is at the tip of the pyramid. So the papillary duct then is going to drain into that minor calyx which then drains into the major calyx, which then drains into the renal pelvis, which drains into the ureter, then to the urinary bladder, then to the urethra, and then out of the body. Down below here, we can see the cells that are making the lining of the tubule. In the renal corpuscle, there's simple squamous cells because that's where we're going to have filtration. Then we see in the proximal convoluted tubule, there's going to be the cuboidal cells that have abundant microvilli. And whenever we see microvilli, we know that there's going to be absorption going on. So in the proximal convoluted tubule is a lot of reabsorption. In the nephron loop, there is simple squamous cells. And then back in the... Um, Distal convoluted tubule, there are cuboidal cells with microvilli, again, for reabsorption. The purpose of telling you about the different cells that line the tubule is so that you can see that there will be different functions throughout the different sections of the nephron. And the reason why uh, the different sections can have different functions is because they are lined by different cells. So we'll go through and we're going to talk about all of the functions of the different parts of the nephron in the next video. So here's another picture of the nephron. And so here we have, this is the renal corpuscle on this side. The renal corpuscle is made up of the glomerular capsule uh, as well as the glomerulus. And then we have the proximal convoluted tubule. We have the nephron loop down here.
And the nephron loop actually, uh, it, it extends all the way from about here, all the way over to about here. And then we have the distal convoluted tubule, and then we have the collecting duct. Right now you're seeing the nephron as it's all spread out, but actually the nephron bends over on itself. And the distal convoluted tubule has these, uh, it's lined by these special cells that are called the macula densa. And so when this nephron bends over, the macula densa, these cells right here, they're going to come in contact with these specialized cells of the um, afferent arterial. So this is the afferent arterial right here. And there are these specialized cells. And so as it bends over, these cells of the distal convoluted tubule come in contact with these cells of the afferent arterial. Now the cells of the afferent arterial are modified smooth muscle and they are called the juxtaglomerular cells. So we have these special cells and they communicate with each other because they're actually touching each other and they can communicate. The macula densa cells along with the juxtaglomerular cells they make up this complex that we call the juxtaglomerular complex. So the uh, macula densa, the cells of the distal convoluted tubule, they are chemoreceptors. And so they're going to be detecting um, things, they're going to be detecting like solute concentration in the distal convoluted tubule. The juxtaglomerular cells, these are modified smooth muscles. So there's modified smooth muscle cells, and they act as baroreceptors and chemoreceptors as well. They also act as a, an endocrine tissue. They secrete hormones. We will talk more about the juxtaglomerular complex and the hormones that are being secreted from the juxtaglomerular cells in our next video. So that ends our first video, which is on the anatomy of the kidneys. And we will continue in our next video and talk about the function and the physiology of the kidneys.